illustrate that first one. Um, he's taught at the University of New South Wales. Do you know where that is, New South Wales? In Australia. Okay, so in Australia, he's taught at Western Oregon, at San Diego State, and at UCLA. So we're very fortunate to have um, him here. Um, he's uh, published one book talking about the family in late antiquity. He's edited two other books, has numerous um, uh, publications and conference presentations um, looking at issues related to gender and history and religious history. Um, some interesting topics having to do with um, family life and what it was like to be a bachelor or what it was like to be a stepfather um, in ancient times. So I think that's really uh, fascinating. Um, and his talk today um, has to deal with refugees in the late Roman Empire. And so um, let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, as uh, Waverly said, I am a um, social historian by training, and I focus mostly on the history of the family. That's my uh, was my initial sort of major scholarly interest, and I've continued that. Um, uh, in addition to being though being a social historian, I also work in the period of what we used to call the late Roman Empire or uh, sub-Roman world or the end of the Roman world. And now we like to use the word late, uh, the phrase late antiquity, which is uh, now sort of a distinctive historical field unto itself. And one of the things that's really interesting about this field, above and beyond my personal interest in social history in that particular region, is that that period of late antiquity comes at the end of the ancient world. And it's often uh, tied into the questions about the fall or the collapse or the decline or the disintegration of the Roman Empire. And that's a very, very old, old uh, uh, question, historiographical question. In fact, uh, it goes back all the way to the 14th century. Um, maybe you've heard of Petrarch, maybe not. Uh, he was, in many ways, the sort of the, the, the founder of the Italian Renaissance. And he was the first one who said, well, you know, what happened to Rome? Why did it disappear? Why did it disintegrate? Uh, et cetera. And in fact, he coined the term the Middle Ages. That, that term was coined as this, this large period of time that happened between, you know, when he was living and when all that good, wonderful Roman and Greek stuff uh, existed. Um, and really, it's been a question that's been asked for the last five, six hundred years, um, starting um, very seriously in the modern historiography uh, in the 17th century. Hello. Uh, more famously, you probably, all of you have probably heard in the 18th century, Edward Gibbon's The Decline and the Fall of the Roman Empire. And really from uh, Gibbon, who is living in the 18th century onward, nonstop, there has been a continuing discussion about why or how or in what way the Roman Empire fell apart and disintegrated. Um, so this is a continuing discussion, continuing, uh, continuing debate uh, amongst historians, and I don't intend to get into that particular debate here. But I thought it would be worthwhile just kind of showing very briefly that uh, in 1984, a, a German historian, uh, Alexander de Mont, wrote a book on just how many people have written about this particular topic. And sort of at the end of his book, sort of half-jokingly, uh, he decided to include a list of all the possible reasons why the Roman Empire collapsed. And he managed to come up with 210. So I had to really squeeze this down so I could fit all 210 uh, 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 reasons on it. We don't, you don't have to know that, but it gives you an idea of just how uh, big the history, the historiography of this is, is that, in fact, um, I've heard this said, and I probably believe it's true, um, that it is the, has been the single most discussed historical question in the discipline of history is why the Roman Empire fell apart. Now, I'm not going to be uh, talking about that. But in all of those discussions, what really hasn't been looked at in any depth is the human toll uh, upon both uh, native Roman populations and foreign populations because of these uh, massive, uh, massive changes. And these really started in the late 4th century, somewhere around 350 or 360, and continued on for several hundred years, well through the 6th. Um, and it, the reality was is, is that during this period that there was uh, warfare on Roman imperial uh, territory during this time, large scale, ongoing, consistent. Um, there was the settlement of peoples, so-called Germanic peoples, the Germans who came from Central Europe and Eastern Europe and moved southward and westward into the heart of the Roman Empire and settled around uh, the Mediterranean uh, uh, world. It also included the loss of Roman law, 
the ability to administer the state, control the state, uh, regulate uh, commerce, those sorts of things, all those essentially uh, disappear uh, uh, in this period. And it meant that, uh, that refugees in this period, both singly and in large gr uh, groups, became increasingly uh, common uh, place around here. Now, today I'm not going to talk about the large scale uh, effect or look at the large scale dispossession uh, and movement of these people, but focus specifically on individual cases. Uh, in uh, the late uh, Roman world uh, and look all, not only at the specific cases but also look at how uh, the, uh, uh, how, uh, uh, the state in particular reacted to these uh, separations. In other words, these crises, these refugees crises started to develop uh, in the 4th and 5th century and um, how the uh, state responded says a lot about how they look at uh, how they looked at refugees and refugees crisis and I should point out uh, that uh, before I came, uh, as last night I was online and I looked on at the uh, UN uh, High Commission on Refugees and the official count of refugees in the world today is somewhere around 22 million very large numbers, probably large, much more. That's the official count. So many things I'm going to be talking about today are, in fact, also reflect the modern experiences of refugees in, uh, in this period as well. There was a large degree of just after World War II. Actually, that is the genesis of this interesting project. I was, on a, uh, I was in a uh, workshop about empire and family, and uh, several of the people were talking about dispossessed persons immediately following World War II, and that really didn't settle down for five or six years. So it is the largest now, the largest number of refugees, uh, as you say, since the, the, end of, uh, the end of World War II. So what I'm going to do today is look at these individual, uh, these individual cases uh, and also look at the response of the state to these. How do you handle these problems? These are problems that modern states have to do as well. And also look at the response of the one NGO in the ancient world, a uh, non-government organi organization. You may have heard that, that term before, and that's the church. So I'm going to look at the responses from the church uh, and the state and see how they dealt uh, with these crises. Now, I'm going to be looking at certain kinds uh, of refugees. Um, and they are refugees whose statuses were created by specific problems of the late Roman age. And those include people who were fleeing uh, the effects of war, those who were fled or exiled due to religious persecution, uh, prisoners of war, and those who had been kidnapped. And in the case of flight, when people are fleeing, uh, such circumstances tended to occur as a result of hostilities between two or more parties. This is, again, quite common in the late Roman Empire. In cases where individuals were forcibly removed uh, from their homes, their families, uh, and their communities, obviously their separation was not voluntary. Moreover, victims of kidnapping, and they're a little bit strange, I'll talk about them a little bit more in a second, might happen at any time, even at times of relative peace. And some people would argue that they don't fit right into, uh, into that particular period. So these are the people that I'm going to look at. Now, by means of background, when the first Roman emperor, have you guys, are you, have you guys done History 100 yet? Yeah, history major. Okay, so you know who Augustus is, I take it. He was the first Roman emperor. Well, when he sent up an imperial system that normally controlled a large state that spanned three different continents, that came with it with a recognition that the state had certain kinds of expectations. In other words, people expected the state to uh, respond to certain things, invasion, uh, disasters, etc. And it's also perhaps worth observing that the physical and social dislocations in the period that I'm talking about, this period at the end of the Roman Empire, were nothing new. And most emergencies and problems were actually caused by so-called natural events, things like famine, weather, uh, uh, earthquakes, fire, etc. So that continues on. That doesn't disappear in the period I'm talking about. But I want to focus on specifically on man-made crises. That is, things that human beings, if they had chosen to act in certain different ways, these crises might not have happened and look at them within this particular context. So I'm looking at a very specific, uh, kind, uh, 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 specific type uh, of refugee. Um, finally, uh, both the state and the church, and I want to put, set this at right at the beginning, had relatively li limited abilities to deal with these crises. 
this is just a uh, you know, practical thing, that they effectively had real problems with them, just as modern states often have trouble dealing with refugee crises uh, uh, today. Even in more peaceful times, the state's response to these sort of emergencies were often reactive. Uh, they were piecemeal. No standard policy ever emerged about how to deal with uh, refugees. No contingency <coughs> programs uh, were, ever, uh, were ever set up. In fact, and sometimes the state actively tried to avoid setting up programs of relief on a standing basis. There's a ve very famous story of a Roman emperor, uh, second century emperor by the name of Trajan. And he gets a request from the city of Nicomedia, which is off in the east somewhere, it's in modern Turkey, and they want to set up an emergency response team to any kind of emergency crisis. There had been a big fire in Nicomedia, and Trajan says no. And the reason he says no is because, not only because he wants the state to be more passive, but he also wants the state to avoid taking on any extra responsibility. So it's this, there's this kind of this, this real reticence on the state on it. The church, on the other hand, um, had a very long history uh, and a mission indeed, an institutional mission of providing financial aid uh, and other forms of support, especially for those in their own community, the marginalized and the dispossessed, people like widows, orphans, et cetera. They were often the, the poor, et cetera. They were often the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the individuals that the uh, church was most interested uh, in helping. So in some ways, they were uh, better equipped or at least better disposed to deal with these kinds of emergencies. Now, sometimes it could be uh, help on a very large scale. So for example, we know from the fourth century Christian historian Eusebius that the church in the city of Rome by the third century was supporting huge numbers of poor people. We, he says as many as 1,500 poor Christians were being actually supported day to day by the church. That's a very large uh, number, uh, a number of people. But practical help when the church gave it was almost entirely local. Very rarely does it go be beyond uh, a single parish, that is where a priest administers, or occasionally an episcopate, that's where a bishop uh, administer. So it was still always very local and piecemeal uh, as, well, as well. Instead, generally, when people fell upon hard times, when there were these kinds of crises, often it was local and voluntary help that was the norm, that is unofficial responses. And there were a number of social relationships that facilitated that. So, for example, the relationship between patrons and clients, that is someone wealthy and rich, a patron, took upon his self in return for their service certain responsibilities of physical aid and protection when they needed to. There was another form of kind of social networking that existed as well, and that was related to those amongst the elite, those who had a certain social standing, who had certain kinds of uh, status within Roman society, could be friends without actually knowing one another. In other words, there was a kind of semi-formal system of friendship. It was called amicitia, which literally means in Latin, means friends. That presumed mutual obligations as well. You were obligated to help someone who was your friend, your social equal. So that was another method. Conversely, if you didn't have those connections, you were dead to the world. Um, there's a very famous uh, story about a saint, a guy by the name of Severinus, who uh, suddenly appears in what's now modern Austria. He settles down, and nobody knows who he is. And, you know, the, the locals are kind of suspicious of him. Um, he doesn't have any social connections. He has no family. Uh, and, in fact, they suspect him of being a runaway slave or possibly a criminal, etc. So lacking those social connections could be really quite uh, devastating. Um, as one Christian writer, a guy named Salvian, wrote in the uh, mid-5th century, they are not only exiled from their own lands, but from their very selves. So, I mean, that really gives you an indication of how dangerous and how awful, uh, potentially, uh, this could be. And, and exacerbated by having the lack of these kinds of social connections. That introduction uh, completed. Let me turn now to some experience of some individual refugees. And I've chose several uh, different examples uh, to give an indication of their respective problems, but also to provide a basis for understanding the manner in which uh, the official response, uh, response might come. Now, let me emphasize uh, and point out here is that with the exception of some very quite rare cases of refugees, um, uh, and those tend to be from the imperial family because there are some members of the Roman imperial family who become refugees as well, but it, 
with those particular uh, exception, it is almost impossible to tra trace a direct correlation between individual experiences and specific policies, specific laws, specific actions of the state or church. So the examples I'm giving you really just instead provide an environment uh, for which the church and state responses might come. So um, let's start. Um, like the modern world, uh, being a refugee uh, in the ancient one uh, was to become a victim. The Bishop Ambrose, uh, in writing in the fourth century, stated that a refugee's fate was to be a wanderer and to be prey to whomever he encountered. Warfare was often the source of the greatest uh, dislocations, and many civilians were commonly the spoils of victory. For example, in one uh, vandal attack, probably uh, near what is now modern Tripoli uh, in, uh, in Libya, uh, we learn of the misfortunes of a wealthy young girl by the name of Maria, who had been taken from her family estate along with one domestic uh, servant. She had then been sold to a slave trader shipped across the Mediterranean, and then sold again as a slave for masters in what is now modern Syria. And according to Theodoret, who was the local bishop in Syria telling her story, she served for an extended period of time essentially as a domestic slave in the household of these, the Syrian uh, family. And even when she got released, uh, she had to spend another 10 months in this region before finally uh, beginning her trip back home to her family. Not only did this really show that the wealthy were not immune to uh, these kinds of problems and these attacks, but also significantly that young people were particularly uh, favored. They were highly prized. They might fetch the greatest price. And in fact, this guy Theodoret noted that it took some time to gather the funds necessary to buy her freedom. Maria's example um, also incidentally underscores another point about the nature of these, these kinds of attacks and these problems. One very common practice apparently in the ancient world of slave traders was to separate husbands from wives and parents from children. A uh, writer uh, writing in uh, North Africa, a guy named Victor Vita in the fifth century, had said in point of fact that all this was standard practice for all barbarians, but significantly too, we know from another writer contemporary writing in Spain, he says the Romans did the same thing. You simply, when you take captives, you separate them from their various family members. Sometimes it'd go even further. We know about one Roman general who was campaigning in Persia, and not only did he sack villages and cities, and he took many captives, but in point of fact, when he captured all these captives, he took the women and the children under 12, and sent them all off, sold them all as slaves, and for the men, they simply were executed, done away with. So this was, this was a very, uh, very kind of uh, common phenomenon. Now, those who could actually flee, um, often uh, flee these kinds of things, they could get away from war, they could get away from slaves, often became permanent uh, refugees. And this is our second, uh, second example here. These are all aristocratic women. They all come from the city of Rome, Anicia Faltonia Proba, her daughter-in-law, Anicia Juliana, and Demetrius. They all were refugees who basically fled the city of Rome when it was sacked in 410 by the Visigoths. This was a big, big event. In 410, you guys may have heard about that or read about that. This, is a, this was a biggie. This had enormous impact on the Roman state. They were Roman aristocrats, and they, along with other Roman aristocrats, fled to southern Italy and then on to North Africa. Now, they were one of the lucky ones because they were from the senatorial aristocracy. They had enormous wealth. Um, they owned lands, they were absentee landlords in Africa, so they did okay. They survived, they were all right, they were able to support themselves in these circumstances. But we also know that Anikia Proba uh, was married. We don't know what ever happened to her husband. She had two sons in addition to this daughter-in-law. We never hear from them again. She had a grandson, all gone. So this was a, real, this was a reality. What's worse is, is that the two older women, Proba and Juliana never were able to return home. They died in old age in exile. What's also interesting is the youngest one, Demetrius. She uh, does actually, late in life, return to Rome, sometime in the 430s. And in fact, not only does she return back to Rome, she's actually able to reclaim some of her, uh, uh, some of her personal properties, which is, which is pretty cool. 
What's interesting, however, is when she leaves. She leaves in the late, she leaves the city of Carthage, she was living in the city of Carthage in the 430s. In the 430s, the Vandals, another Germanic people, invaded North Africa and took the city of Carthage. So Demetrius was not a refugee one time, but on two occasions. First one, she was probably about 11 or 12, and then in her 40s. And being a, uh, being a refugee was a very common phenomenon. Being a refugee on multiple occasions was a very common phenomenon. We hear about whole towns having to run away from uh, invading Germanic peoples, uh, going to another town, and then having to leave again. Uh, the third fellow, who I'll talk more about in a second, uh, Paulinus of Pella, is another interesting example of it. He also had to move several times before finally settling in the south of Gaul. So such displacements were pretty common. As one writer wrote, a guy named Severus, he had, in fact advised this, when they persecute you in one city, move to another. Now, some people were able to return home. They did not have to have permanent, uh, permanent displacement. But even for them, there might be a problem associated with that. So for example, we read from Salvian, uh, this, this writer uh, writing in Gaul, um, very interestingly that he said that a number of refugees were able actually to return to their homes and their lands. But they had discovered that they had been plundered. And even worse, they were still liable for the taxes on their land and on their properties, right? So imagine having to get out, leave, uh, leave everything, come back, seeing your, your houses and your uh, properties ruined, and then having to pay taxes. And taxes, by the way, that had accrued over time. For the entire time they were gone, whether it was one year, five years, ten years, uh, etc. And as a result, of course, is that uh, many of these people uh, returning to their homes were under such financial straits that essentially their lands, their properties, were not, because of tax purposes, were not able to be handed off to their heirs. The state simply took them to pay for the, the, the costs. And so it's very little wonder that Salvian says, well, a lot of them end up be joining roving bands of, of criminals just to survive. Etc. So there's a real problem associated with this. So let me turn to our third refugee of war, Paulinus of Pella. And he's really important and significant because he has the most complete story of being a refugee. And interestingly enough, he's the one writing. It's autobiographical. It survives in a poem called the Eucharistikos, which in uh, Greek literally means the thanksgiving. Like he's thankful for his life, which is ironic given what his life was like. It's perhaps the most ironically named poem uh, uh, in history. Um, um, he was a very interesting individual and really details the realities of becoming homeless and dispossessed, and, uh, dispossessed by the fortunes of politics and war. Um, he had come from a very prominent uh, senatorial family. His father had been a governor in Macedonia. He proconsul of Africa, uh, Paulinus himself uh, had rather reluctantly uh, become a major civil official in the government of an imperial pretender. The problem was is that imperial pretender, he ended up failing. Uh, he was killed in 415, which left Paulinus in a rather bad situation. And interestingly enough, not only did the Roman authorities not like him, but the Visigothic Germans who had settled in the region of Bordeaux where he lived in Lycan. So he was a kind of a double, uh, a, a double uh, refugee. Um, and as a result, you know, he pretty much lost everything. Um, he had uh, his house was burned and looted. In fact, his mother's house was burned and looted just for good measure. Uh, Paulinus lost his family estates in the region of Bordeaux. He nearly died in a siege of one city. Uh, and in fact, he lived out his old age alone and impoverished. His wife, in the process of these, uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, troubles, had predeceased him. His sons had done so uh, as well. One of them, in fact, seems to have been a hunted man of some sort. His one daughter seems to have escaped. She managed to escape with her husband. And Paulinus says, well, maybe she made it to Africa, but he doesn't know. He's lost to her permanently. He never sees uh, his daughter again. Um, Thus, really in kind of one example, uh, Paulinus' experience articulated the political, the social, and economic consequences of becoming a refugee. And in fact, that the uh, former aristocrat had lost his social standing, he had lost his family, 
uh, and nearly died twice before settling on a small plot of land near the city of Marseille, imply profound emotional and psychological impact. So these are our refugees of war. Let me now turn to our religious. Our religious refugees are a rather interesting phenomena because um, once Rome became Christian in the fourth century, the great persecutions that had existed in the past when Christianity was illegal had come to an end. And yet, significant with all these problems coming up uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, period, um, significantly um, the, uh, the, the settlement of Germanic peoples uh, who were not, uh, were not uh, Catholic Christians but Aryan Christians began what be became a, a series of religious persecutions. Now, this wasn't completely unforeseen. Already uh, within the Roman Empire itself, uh, a number of emperors had started to think that a matter of religion and right belief was a matter of law and order. That, in other words, that the state was responsible for enforcing religious orthodoxy, uh, etc. And this is something that seems to have been, uh, seems to have been uh, fairly common. And so, as a result, even under the empire, there had been small scale, if you'd like to think of small, uh, small uh, scale persecutions against religious refuseniks. Augustine of Hippo, who wrote The City of God, most of you have heard it, in the 420s, essentially was a book that was written in reaction uh, to perhaps the most famous man-made crisis in late antiquity, and he saw it in religious terms, and saw many of these as people who were religiously uh, persecuted. And indeed, uh, the Vandals in North Africa, mostly against the uh, Catholic uh, uh, clergy, um, their actions against them can only be characterized as a widespread and fairly sustained persecution. And though, although it focused on bishops and priests, it's clear that the laity uh, suffered as well. So who were targeted uh, by the Vandals? Well, there were certain religious groups that were persona non grata. So uh, people like the Manichaeans, and the Manichaeans were kind of an offshoot heresy of Christianity, and they believed odd things. They believed in two gods. I don't want to go into it, but they were one of the groups that were most actively persecuted against by the Vandals. And the Vandals systematically throughout the second half of the fifth century found them, arrested them, sold them as slaves for overseas markets. Get rid of them as quickly as possible. Uh, but significantly too, like the victims of war, refugees of war, we know most about refugees who are from the more privileged classes, those who had wealth, had status, etc. And we often learn about the personal dimensions of their dislocate, uh, dislocation. So quite apart from becoming uh, a refugee, the emotional impact could be especially severe, even where it was avoidable. For example, um, Saturus. Saturus was a Roman, but interestingly enough, he had an official position in the Vandal King's court in North Africa in the 470s. Saturus, however, was a Roman, and he was a Catholic. He was an Orthodox Christian. The uh, king of the Vandals, however, enacted a new law that said anyone who's serving the king has to be an Aryan Christian, has to convert to our form of Christianity. He kind of resisted. He didn't want to do this. And it's interesting to see where he gets the pressure from. It's not from the state. It's from his wife. His wife says, think about what you're doing. You've got to convert. Think about me. Think about my welfare. Think about my ch children's welfare. Now, of course, uh, Saturus refuses. He stays a good, decent Christian. And what happens? He gets kicked out of the court. He gets tortured. Uh, his uh, lands and properties are possessed, are uh, repossessed by the state, and, and he is forced into exile. We never even hear what happens to his family. We can imagine what happens to them as well. So this is a real example of the way in which uh, this, uh, you know, these, these, uh, this religious per persecution could happen. It isn't only, um, it isn't only uh, the poor. However, I mean the rich. However, it's not only the the the, the elite in society. We know that religious exile affected the poor and marginalized even more. We have another great, wonderful story um, from a uh, a bishop in Africa named Victor of B Vita. And Victor of Vita was walking along a country road, and he ran across this old woman. He was with some other clerics. This old woman who was destitute. She had nothing. All she had was a little four or five-year-old granddaughter who wanted to have a blessing from 
the from the from the uh, from uh, from the bishop. And what's significant is we know nothing about her. We don't know how she got there or why. And the interesting thing is the reaction of Victor Evita, this bishop. He's like at first he's kind of standoffish. He says, "Who are you? Get away from me! Where is your husband? You know, you don't have any wealth. Uh, where's your home? Right?" So he doesn't know him. Remember how I'm talking about having these lack of social connections can really have an impact on a person or on a group. So they just sort of like, he's standoffish. And then he finds out that this woman, this old woman is actually the daughter of a very famous old bishop who is dead but still very long respect. Then he, then he changes his tune a little bit. Then he goes, oh, it's really bad. He, he sheds a few tears for him. He offers a blessing, and then off he goes on his way. And the woman's left by the side of the road. So you can see that that this was not the, not necessarily the the the, the best uh, the best uh, result. But this was kind of a much more common real reality. So those are some gives you some idea of the religious refugees. What about some kidnapping uh, victims? Now, obviously, uh, as I said, uh, peacetime uh, during peacetime during war, kidnapping could happen at any time. Um, and these are people who were kidnapped uh, specifically uh, for uh, a slave market. They, these guys, admittedly, are substantively different from those who were victims of war uh, and of persecution. First, of course, the specific purpose for their abduction was for their abductors to make a profit. That's their ostensible purpose. And perhaps it's also an indication of the trouble with Rome's slave supply. One of the big arguments going on right now amongst historians of the ancient world, of the Roman world, is just where the hell they get all their slaves. And I won't get into that there, but this might be an indication uh, of this. In the case of kidnapping in this period, in late antiquity, its apparent growth created concern in many communities, not only because free persons were targets, but also specific types of free persons dictated by the needs of the market. And it is true uh, that these people are not refugees in the sense that they fled their homes because of disaster, but they were in the sense that they became displaced from family and from community, often in permanent ways. The best example uh, of these problems actually come from Augustine. Remember I just mentioned Augustine's City of God. Last 20, 30 years, we've actually discovered some new letters written by Augustine, about 30, 31 new letters. He wrote voluminously. This guy wrote everything we have hundreds of letters and sermons that survive from him as well as more major works. But um, in two of the recovered letters, um, he had to face what seems to have been an ongoing problem locally with an illegal business in human trafficking. And the bishop writes of slave traders uh, preying upon the mostly free native populations in Numidia uh, in the 420s, especially among the Colonni. Now the Colonni were kind of like Roman serfs. They are the precursor of the serf. That is, they were legally free, but they were tied to the land. They didn't have the freedom of movement. They seemed to have been a real object. They were the ones being abducted and being enslaved. Moreover, again, and this gets back to this market of what market want, in a large number of cases, children were being abducted and then often sold as slaves. Um, and what was particularly upsetting uh, to the bishop was that these illegal slaves were being frequently shipped off across the Mediterranean Sea, never to be seen from again. Only in one case was the bishop able to release a girl uh, with the use of church funds. So very little wonder that Augustine was disgusted to see that there were some slave traders in his own congregation sitting there you know, in the church on Sunday morning. And he calls them out, actually, uh, in one sermon. So taken as a whole, these kidnapping refugees, these religious refugees, these refugees of war, um, uh, all bore certain types of common problems. Loss of status, loss of home and homeland, loss of family members, and considerable emotional and psychological trauma. And in this sense, they, they are very similar to the modern refugee in the modern world, uh, whose displacement uh, and often produces a series of challenges for governments, for agencies, for charitable organizations all trying to help them. So, those are some of, the, some of the examples. Let me talk about the way in which the state and the church uh, try to respond. Um, so, to be fair, I have to say that both uh, the church and the state did try to use the tools that were available for, uh, to them. We know, for example, uh, that in the case of Galla Placidia, uh, who was the sister of a Roman emperor, 
Her return from semi-captivity was predicated on a promise from her brother's government to secure an enormous payment of wheat to the Visigoths who had, ha, had uh, uh, kidnapped her. Uh, the Emperor Leo I may have paid the Vandals a similar a ransom in 460 for the return of Licinia Eudoxia and Placidia, who were the wife and the daughter of the Emperor Valentinian III. But these are exceptions. Uh, not the rule. We know, for example, that not only were many Romans abducted and kept as slaves by the Huns in the 5th century, but it was also clear that the state had no interest and had no intention in redeeming them. In fact, it was so bad that in one case, one bishop who was afraid of being possibly kidnapped by the Huns took some church property and gave it to a friend so that he would have money or uh, uh, money uh, purposes uh, available to free him should he become uh, a captive and needed to be ransomed. Now, the information that we have about for direct cases of government response are very meager. In the case of those who might be taken prisoner, who might be kidnapped in peacetime, there seems to be a casual acceptance that the, reason, uh, that the ransoms were the responsibility of the captives, even if it was on a mass scale. Again, returning to that emperor, Leo I, he, he might buy the freedom of an empress and her daughter, but the emperor made no attempt to ransom thousands of other Romans who were uh, kidnapped uh, by the Vandals, taken prisoner by the Vandals. Perhaps more telling is, was the captivity of a late Roman aristocrat, and he was also a bishop, by the name of Sidonius Apollinaris. Um, he was forced to pledge one-third of his mother-in-law's estate as a surety for his release from the Visigoths. Um, so this whole concept of prisoner taken, prisoner pays, is a commonality in the Roman world. In fact, it had a long tradition in the ancient world, so this was nothing new. What was new was is that the church did say that occasionally that if you help someone get free, that was a good work. Augustine says very famously, this is kind of a form of almsgiving. So it was something that was laudable, but regardless, it remained significantly a private, uh, a private affair. Now, there was one place in which the state did try to free Roman citizens, and that was soldiers. Soldiers were important to them, and so in point of fact, the Roman state did try to secure the release of, uh, of those in the military. We know, for example, that in the case of Attila the Hun, uh, that the Roman government played, paid a certain amount of money for each soldier that was uh, each was ransomed. But that's the exception. That was essentially it. Everyone else and all non-combatants were left to their own fates. So these are the civilian prisoners of war. What about those who might have been kidnapped in peacetime? And there too, the government uh, seems to be, uh, both on an imperial level and on a regional le level, seem to be pretty inactive. Again, uh, from Augustine, he damns those acts of kidnapping of free people as an offense to Roman liberty, but such frustration clearly indicates that the state was in fact doing uh, very little indeed. Uh, and indeed, although the Roman legal codes are filled with laws again, which forbade the enslavement of free Romans, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a second, we have no indications of how many sl uh, slave traders were actually prosecuted. In fact, we have a lot of circumstantial evidence that very few were prosecuted at all. Essentially, uh, these laws were on the books, but no one paid any attention to them. The best indication of this passivity comes again in the affair of that young girl, Maria, who had been kidnapped and sent overseas. Even after her owners became aware that in fact she was a free person, illegally, uh, illegally kidnapped and sold as a slave, um, they didn't try to free her. And when her status became generally known throughout the city in which she lived, the state didn't try to free her. It was only thanks uh, to the generosity of four soldiers pulling together their monies that she became free. So in short, the state took no part even in rectifying a patently illegal act. Finally, for those who did flee the ravages of warfare, true refugees if the like, again, the government also took little direct action. In the wake of the sack of Rome in 410, as I already mentioned, many of the wealthy old Roman senatorial aristocrats took it on the land, heading to southern Italy and in North Africa. And North Africa, in fact, for a time was inundated with a large number of these rich old senatorial families that they hadn't seen in generations. 
But what's significant about it is, is none of them expect any help from the imperial government. And they don't ask the imperial government for help. What help they do receive has specifically to do with their personal connections with the local elites, the other aristocrats living in North Africa. That's how they, that's how they, get, uh, 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 that's how they get help. So those are all the things the state doesn't do. What does it actually do uh, in these circumstances? Well, obviously the most proactive thing they did was to try to defend the Roman Empire, uh, to defend it militarily against outsiders, invaders, migrators, however you want to uh, characterize them. But that really says about protecting uh, the homes and the lives of people in the state who still have them. It says nothing about those who were dispossessed uh, already. Um, they also significantly, uh, uh, the Romans also, uh, government also started to pay increasingly large amounts of tribute, basically bribing outside forces to go away and leave them alone. Now, again, this was nothing new. This had been going on for centuries. What's different in this period is the state is starting to shell out larger and larger and larger amounts of money. More and more of its financial resources are associated with that. The best example of that was the Roman Empire continuing trying to pay off Attila the Hunt. And finally, eventually, what, why Attila invaded, they finally said, screw it. We're not going to pay you anymore. You guys, uh, you know, do what you may. And that's exactly what they did. The, the Huns invaded the Roman state. Um, but again, this really said about, was more about maintaining the integrity of the Roman Empire and Roman territory than helping those who had been dispossessed. So this was a problem. Uh, this was a problem uh, as well. In most cases, uh, however, the emperors of the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries made use of their most abundant, re uh, abundant resource to ameliorate uh, these problems, and that was legislation, laws, etc. They enacted a number of laws directly and tangentially uh, related to both the theoretical uh, and real results of the dislocated and dispossessed. And for the most part, they fell into two kinds of, uh, two kinds of laws, two categories, laws concerning property, and laws concerning per, uh, persons. In both cases, the practical question of legal status came into play when someone was uh, dispossessed because of warfare. And starting in the fifth century, laws prohibited Romans from imprisoning or enslaving refugees who remained on Roman soil. For example, the emperor uh, Honorius in the year 408 passed a law that said, look, there are all these refugees coming from what's now the modern Balkans. You can't simply grab them, take them, enslave them, and sell them. It's illegal, etc. And we have other laws very similar to that. We have a law uh, a few months later uh, that says basically that Colony, these Roman serfs, can't be sold into slavery for any reason, no matter what the circumstances, whether they're off the, they're off the farm or not. The biggest changes came in an area of Roman law called post -liminium. And in Latin, that merely means beyond the borders. And this is an old area of Roman law. In other words, what happens when, say, Jonathan here, a fine old Roman citizen, is taken, in a captive, taken as a captive in warfare and is whisked away from his country? What happens to his legal status? What happens to his... Roman citizenship. Does he stay a Roman citizen if he's a slave for an extended period of time? What happens to his legal relationships? Does a marriage stay intact? What right does he have over his property? Can he pass his property on to his heirs? So there are a whole host of, uh, there's a whole area of law which uh, dealt with this has been a long time. In this period of crises, these laws of post liminium received uh, uh, att uh, serious attention. So, for example, the government of the Emperor Justinian, in fact, comprehensively uh, uh, dealt with these problems, stressing the retrospective and permanent nature of a Roman citizen's free condition. Doesn't matter if you're a slave, doesn't mean if you've been away for a long period of time, when you come back, you're still a Roman citizen. These included questions including the legal status of children born to captive Roman parents. Are they legitimate? Are they bastards? That had important legal implications. The technical meaning of bastards, by the way, someone who is illegitimate. Uh, it included reconfirming the financial obligations of redeemed prisoners uh, to their redeemers. Um, it uh, had to deal with the status of inheritances of captured individuals. And perhaps most significantly, Justinian essentially um, extended the term of limitations. In, traditionally, in Roman law, you had two years to get back to your life and reclaim everything 
he extended it to five years. So you had this extended period of time to try to get back out of captivity, uh, out of being a prisoner, out of being a slave, and get back to your, uh, your old life. It would also significantly protect the legality of marriages between spouses who had been separated in conflict. Occasionally, too, the state was even aware uh, that it was not terribly powerful, that it was impotent in some ways. In the wake of the enormous problems caused by Attila the Hun and the invasion of the West, the Emperor Valentinian III actually passed a law that said, okay, if you're starving, if you, uh, you're in or horrible deprivation, and you af you're afraid for your children, you can sell your kids uh, into slavery to make sure that they survive, they endure. But significantly, the parents have the, the first right to buy them back, buy their freedom, and under no condition do you take those children that have been sold into slavery and you move them overseas. You keep them there. So this is kind of a dealing with, dealing with these, these, these sorts of problems. So these are the primary actions of the state. It's pass laws to try to protect uh, these refugees as much as possible. What about the church? The church's response was, interestingly enough, equally mixed. And there seems to have been no really clear mandate of the church about how to involve themselves in these issues uh, when they came up. When, how do we deal with someone who was kidnapped or taken prisoner or simply fl fleeing from some emergency? But it does seem common enough for bishops to use the monies and the properties of the church to try to ransom uh, prisoners, at least if they're from their own diocese, if they're from their own parish, etc. But Episcopal help was not necessary. Church help was not necessarily guaranteed, and such help might even invite criticism. So, for example, we know that one fifth-century bishop actually brought criminal charges against another bishop for misusing church property. He had sold the property in order to provide relief for the local population. So it was not guaranteed that the church might actually uh, act in this way. On the other hand, even if it lacked the funds or the will to help refugees, the church might at the very least ease their situations. Now, um, one of the things that they did would often try to facilitate deals to uh, free captive Romans. But um, the case of Maria, returning to the young girl again, she's another, she's again a very good uh, case in point. She illustrates the various forms of support. While the local bishop himself did not pay uh, for her manumission, he did put her under the care of one of his deacons. And he moreover wrote to another bishop in the region of Cilicia, which is now modern southeastern Turkey, to help her book passage with a trustworthy ship and crew so that she might return home to Africa. It's also perhaps uh, worth mentioning that this same bishop wrote eight letters to friends and officials on behalf of another refugee of the Vandals, a city councilman who had managed to escape with his family and household, but very little else. It's both important to, it's important to note that both in the case of Maria and this town councilor, they were both elite refugees. That's important, right? They're the ones who have access to, uh, to certain kinds of support that not, might not be given to poor or more humble people. You only have to return to that poor old woman by the side of the road in Africa to see the disparities in such efforts. Sometimes, very rarely, the church might act on a grander scale. The church historian Socrates recounts how in the 420s, the patriarch of Constantinople provided refuge for Persian Christians who were being persecuted by the Persian king, although in what way he doesn't really say. Even more unusual, a Gallic bishop, that is in France, apparently gathered together refugees from Attila's invasion and created a kind of mountain colony uh, in 452, a new city that was made up of refugees of the dispossessed, and the first ever description of a permanent refugee center. Very interesting, but unusual. Much more commonly, the church could prevail upon the laity to help. Augustine asked his flock in one sermon delivered late in 410 to be hospitable to refugees arriving from Rome and Italy. Occasionally, too, bishops might ask one another for aid. So that fellow I mentioned before, Sidonius Apollinaris, he wrote to one fellow bishop asking for help that he might give against an impending attack uh, by the Visigoths. Um, and he asked uh, this more influential uh, bishop, cleric, that if he couldn't help in this regard, that he at least provide housing for refugees and ransom money for those who might be captured. A second response of the church was in many ways to mirror the legal actions 
of the state with ecclesiastical court rulings and church policies. With specific reference to refugees, Pope Innocent I in the early 5th century ruled that the marriage of a woman who had been held captive and later freed was still valid. More comprehensively, uh, uh, Pope Leo I dealt with the practical and spiritual aftermath of Attila's invasion in the 450s. The Pope explains that marriages were inviolable, and thus any man returning from captivity, irrespective of the length of time, would regain his wife even if she had remarried. Now, not only does this letter consider all contingencies, things like wives who did not wish to be reunited with their first husbands, uh, the spiritual status of the second husbands who had gone ahead and married uh, this woman, etc., but he also is concerned with other practical me uh, measures or issues associated with captivity from a Christian perspective. These included things like being baptized by heretics. Ooh, that's really wild. Eating sacramental food in order to survive, eating the host things like this uh, in order to survive. So in many ways, the church tried to fashion an ecclesiastical equivalent of these laws of post laminium as well. A third thing, interesting reaction to the church, is that quite apart from the practical considerations of the refugee, they became very interested in the spiritual well-being of them. And this focused initially on the issue of baptism. Now, everybody knows what baptism, baptism is. Does anyone not know what baptism <coughs> is? Okay, so this is the, po the point where the, uh, the divine grace of, uh, of Christ is imbued upon a person, and that's when they become uh, fully uh, a Christian. Now, in the ancient world, baptism was a funny thing. We all think about baptisms like you get born and you very quickly have a baptism, you know, you're like eight days old, etc., and then you're a Christian, etc. That's not how it worked in the ancient world. Up until the end of the fourth century, in point of fact, you didn't get baptized. Even if you were a Christian, you didn't get baptized until you were well into your adult life. Why? Because you wanted to know what it meant to actually take on the responsibilities of being a Christian. And the whole idea of sinning, once you were under divine grace from baptism, was ooh, that was a real real no-no. So, take example, already in the late 4th century, for example, Augustine, remember I mentioned Augustine, this guy again and again, he's a really interesting guy. When he was a boy, he grew, as a teenager, he grew deathly ill, and he asked his mom, Monica, uh, to, if you know Santa Monica, that's who she's named after, uh, Monica said, can I be baptized, please? And she said no, because she was afraid that he would recover, and he would do the sorts of sins that teenagers do. Uh, as it turns out, Monica knew her, her, her son very well because that's precisely what he did. He recovered and then he, he did some pretty, pretty un interesting things. We'll just leave it at that. So, um, so um, there was this real kind of concern. But despite the fact that this was, a, this was a common practice, there were still enormous fears about infants growing ill and dying. Uh, and dying without this divine grace. Uh, one fourth century cleric noted the tragedies of infants who died from the horrors of this world unbaptized. They wouldn't enjoy the kingdom of heaven. They wouldn't enjoy the everlasting, uh, the everlasting bliss uh, uh, under God. So this is a big deal. As he's put it, they will not share in the city of God. By the beginning of the 5th century, however, this concern extended directly to those children who might be separated from the parents because of kidnapping <laughs> or being made prisoners of war. So one church synod uh, held at the city of Carthage in 401 was first to take the unusual step of ordering the immediate baptism of children who had been separated their families and consequently unsure of whether they had been baptized or not. Later, uh, Pope Leo I, partially as a response to vandal attacks, oversaw another council and ordered the same policy. Um, so, in fact, uh, if you look at a majority of 4th and 5th century canon laws, which dealt with children, a majority of them concerned the issue of baptism. And indeed, by the end of the 5th century, baptism for infants had largely become a standard practice in the church continues to do so as, uh, as well. The last thing that the church did was to cultivate an entire body of literature that dealt with the spiritual and emotional problems of this world. So when we look at some of the sermons and the homilies given in the weeks and months that followed the sack of Roman 410, we start to see some interesting themes that, about exile, about refuge, etc., that develop into a discourse of pastoral care. In the aftermath of the sack of Rome, bishops and priests did what they could to reassure a frightened 
and confused Christian audience. By December of 410, Augustine spoke of the need not to be frightened by such events and reminded his parishioners that this was a burden, but not a stumbling block. Uh, he said, quote, become young in Christ instead of old in this world. In the following year, he would write further sermons to exhort his flock to think about the world to come. Moreover, as the church continued to move away from the kind of triumphalism uh, that it had characterized the religion after Constantine the Great had legalized it. Once Constantine had legalized Christianity, Christians thought they were winning. They were, everything was going well. Um, he sort of gets people to pull away, conceptually uh, at least, from being, uh, making too close an association between the events of this world and divine providence. The citizens of the heavenly city may live upon the world, but not in it. The themes found in Augustine's sermons start to appear with greater frequency in the 5th and the 6th centuries. One writer, probably writing in the 450s, spoke to his congregation on the importance of prayer as a haven from life's ills. Uh, uh, Caesarius of Arles, who was a 5th century uh, bishop in southern France, turned the concept of flight on its head by suggesting that the good Christian should be a refugee from the hindrances of this world. And in fact, earlier in that same sermon, he states the entire human race was put into exile because of Adam's sin. So this playing with the concept of refugee became a very common motif. Writing somewhat later, another, uh, another French uh, 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 cleric claimed the uh, exile was not a loss of homeland, but its transformation. By focusing on our souls, we become landlords without properties and prosperous without possessions. So for many late Christians, uh, this was clearly meant to give spiritual reassurance, even as it was perhaps becoming something slightly uh, trite. So, in sum, uh, these responses of the imperial government and the church as a whole articulate a number of interesting and at times contradictory forms uh, of help uh, for the refugee in late antiquity. Uh, and while we can acknowledge uh, their differences and occasionally conflicting approaches when dealing with the dispossessed, with refugees, there are certain commonalities in understanding the normative attitudes towards refugees, at least from an institutional perspective. <coughs> First, both the church and the state placed enormous emphasis on the issue of inheritance, of property, and the proper transmission of property from an owner to his or her heirs. Uh, the association of property with family, or as the Romans called it, familia, uh, as one of the defining characteristics of family, was an important sociological and legal concept that went throughout Roman history. And this was certainly true, or especially true, in the crises of the late Roman world, and thus articulated not only the importance of property as part of what makes up a family, but also, by extension, the long-held patriarchal notions concerning the prerogatives of a pater familius, that is, the head of the household over his patrimony, to give out his property to his heirs as he see fit. And while such concerns might not extend to things like imperial tax policy, the government still wanted its money, the right of an individual to reclaim what had been his in the wake of flight or captivity, in war, or in cases of kidnap, became enshrined and extended by both the church and the state alike. Second, both showed a concern for maintaining the integrity of a family as a group. The bonds that brought, uh, kept families together, usually these were pietas, which means piety, fam uh, familiar piety, and obsequium, or, uh, uh, or duty uh, to the family, these help to create a collective identity. So the physical separation of a family's individual members was to destroy that identity, but also its functions of mutual responsibility and aid. The practical problems of reuniting a family once it was scattered, of course, were enormous, in fact, as they still are uh, today. Sidonius Apollinaris, for example, chronicled the problems of one set of brothers as they tried to track down a sister who had been uh, moved and sold on at least several occasions. So one theme constantly remarked upon is keeping the family members from being moved overseas, being moved too far away. And the sources clearly imply that this was a key factor in making dislocation and separation a permanent condition. Finally, third, more than any other group, children 
seem to have been of a special concern to both the government and the church. Conceptualized as the most vulnerable uh, members of society, which is, I think, a pretty good concept. It bears some basis, uh, in fact. Uh, their welfare remained an important uh, concern for the institutional paternalism of the late Roman world. Uh, care in particular for the orphan in the classical world now expanded to a broader investment in the well-being of children and child refugees as a whole. But it also underlies the significance placed on the continuity of the family. Rules of legitimate marriage, of parental authority and inheritance, whether secular or religious, were predicated almost entirely on the basis of the continuation of the kin group, or of a kin group. And while patristic authors, the great church writers of the fourth and fifth centuries, uh, might advocate things like the celibate life, ignore all that, um, they were not blind to the realities of this world. And indeed, bishops and priests by their very professions couldn't afford to be. So uh, let me just say at the end here that I want to stress that these are initial impressions on my part. And this is part of a much broader project on refugees in late antiquity that I'm working on. These conditions and the official responses to them uh, have to be contextualized in a broader understanding of the reaction to disasters of all types. Now, at this point, I can't really say whether the refugees that I've discussed here are necessarily representative of all those who, in one form or another, found themselves homeless uh, and separated from part or all of those uh, uh, in their household. But what I was trying to do here, my purpose here, was to suggest that there are some common themes that emerge from the disturbance to the patterns of daily life and the reactions that mirror a broader problem for the refugee in any time period that we're talking about. Thank you very much. We have time for any questions. Yes, Mark. Oh, uh, I was going to wait. Uh, I had uh, several uh, that I had. one. I, I was looking behind, so I wanted just to check. Yeah. That, does the part of familiar sort of the, the, the religious leanings and inclinations of a the male head of household, as you mentioned with the case where there is the debate over should you convert? Are the families susceptible to being considered heretics, Arians, or Catholics if the father is that? And so it doesn't matter what their own personal leanings are. It's, it depends on male head of household. To vote. Well, in this case, in, in the case, the, the specific case I was talking about, this this fellow Saturus who was being basically told you have to convert or you know face exile and persecution. Um, it seems to only, uh, it's, it's not entirely clear, in part because the Latin is so bad here, but, uh, but it's not entirely clear whether or not uh, this meant that the entire family was meant to convert. But it was, the law stipulated that any official serving in the Hunnic court had to be an Aryan Christian. So the presumption is, is, is that uh, as long as he was uh, uh, an Aryan Christian as opposed to an Orthodox Catholic Christian, that was fine. What that meant in real terms, whether if one family was, you know, one family member was one kind of Christian uh, and another was another, that's a more complicated issue. In fact, that's an issue that Christians talk a lot about. They talk about, you know, what they called mixed marriages. That was their idea of mixed marriages. They were religious mixed marriages, whether someone was a Christian and one was a pagan, or one was one kind of Christian and one was another kind of Christian. That is a very complicated, that's a very complicated question. Oh, you, yes? Uh, <clears throat> couple of questions. Sure. By the way, fascinating lecture. I really, really enjoyed your style as well. Thank you. Uh, really bring the, uh, you know, go along with how fascinating this era is. I am teaching history of Middle East, and the reason why I really wanted to attend this talk was, you know, often that just students are asking me today, like, how do we handle refugees? Like, <laughs> and I was really hoping to ask you that question, and then I refer to Romans, how they handled it, right? So I know that this, well, you didn't really address this, and it might not be within the scope of the project, but were Romans ever host to refugees? Ah, now that's a really, really good question. The answer is yes, they were. And in fact, those could cause problems in and of themselves. One of the, one of the very famous uh, uh, moments of refugee crisis actually came in the period we're talking about. Um, I kept on mentioning the Huns, right? These, these guys, the Huns. And they, the Huns, they really don't, they're not easily kind of identified. We sort of associate them with those sort of semi-nomadic pastoral horse peoples that 
ran along the length of the st uh, steppes of Asia between East Asia and, and, and Western Asia. The Huns, whoever they were exactly, appear in Eastern Europe around 370. And one of the first things they do is they create a large scale dislocation of lo local Germanic peoples. Uh, so the Ostrogoths, which mean the Eastern Goths, and the Visigoths, the Western Goths, people I've talked about in this, in this, uh, in this, in this talk, their movement into the Roman state was precipitated by this dislocation. And in fact, they asked for permission to enter into the Roman world in the mid-370s, and the Romans said yes. The, the idea was that, you know, that these, these Germanic peoples would come in, they'd settle, they'd get some land, and in return they would you know, serve the Roman state in whatever way the Roman emperor saw fit. So the Roman government gives permission for these Ostrogoths and Visigoths to come into the Roman Empire and then promptly ignores them. Doesn't do anything with them. And what it eventuates, of course, is that these refugees start to starve. Uh, they don't, because it's not all just soldiers who are going to go serve the Roman state. They have families, they have children, etc., and it precipitates a large-scale rebellion uh, in the in, in uh, the three seventies, mid three seventies, and the Roman state is actually forced to fight a large-scale battle against them, which ends up disastrously from the Roman state. But that one thing precipitated what would become a long-term migration of Germanic peoples out of Eastern and Central Europe into the Roman Empire that doesn't really stop until the mid sixth century. So there's this waves and waves of these migrating peoples. At first, the Romans say, okay. The other thing that they do is, is when they're there and they can't get rid of them, they try to come to some kind of accommodation with them. They say, okay, we'll settle you here. This land is yours. Um, as long as you serve the Roman state, that's fine. Of course, what really happens is they set up essentially autonomous independent states. And this, this is the, this uh, sort of is the, uh, in some ways, the technical end of the political organization of the Roman Empire, at least in the, its western half. So it is a really interesting thing. It does happen. What it really underscores, and obviously because of technology and interconnectivity, things are a little bit different in the modern world, but it underscores the same problems of the modern refugees, just how much can government do? And in some circumstances, particularly after World War II, not very much. The people who are most responsible for helping refugees get back in contact with their families uh, and their loved ones after World War II wasn't any of the governments, it was the Red Cross. So this is a really interesting problem. And this is obviously, uh, in the modern world, we have a lot of these NGOs that are, are available precisely for this kind of care. But in the ancient world, those things simply didn't exist. And after the U.S. Civil War, just as a kind of comparison, the U.S. Army arranged for free people to be able to have train transit to wherever their family members were, and so they created a series of passes and they could ride on the, on the trains. Uh, the federal government also set up the Freedmen's Bureau, which provided basic um, basic uh, rations of food and they provided some emergency health care and they did try to set up some schools so that they would have enough literacy to be able to function. But what the U.S. government did in those areas would never have stood alone. It depended upon several other church denominations that created Freedmen's Aid Societies with various names and those along with the U.S. government then bailed out, you know, four million former slaves who had nothing but the shirts on their back if they had those. Yeah. Um, uh, I had two more questions to sure. follow. Um, and two, I, I, this is, I guess, obviously questions that where the sources might not be there. Uh, later Roman, but also in the Byzantine period, is the tension and kind of repeated conflict between the Eastern Roman Empire and uh, a Zoroastrian uh, assassin in Persia, and is that creating, especially over the Mesopotamia, I would assume that creates large, these are more authoritarian, more restrictive, uh, religiously imposing, I mean, is that, uh, uh, states, are they creating, therefore, mass refugee movements, and do we know, we have evidence for this? You know, it, it, 
it, it does manifest itself in the area of religion and um, in the case of particularly Christians, uh, but also to a lesser degree Zoroastrians, they become to a certain degree pawns in larger political sort of games between the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. And I mean, there are never any kind of mass scale uh, refugees. Probably the closest thing I can think of in that circumstance is in the early fourth century, uh, when the last great persecution against Christians occur under the Emperor Diocletian, we do hear about the Persian king saying, yeah, you, 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 you heretical Christians, come to Persia, we'll take care of you, don't worry, we'll give you refuge. We'll give you refuge. But as soon as Christianity is legalized, which only comes about 10 years later, they all come running back. Now that causes different problems when they're, when they're back in the Roman Empire, but among other things, it helped to spread Christianity to those regions. That all, however, disappears in the seventh century, of course, with the rise, rise of Islam. And once the Islamic uh, caliphates are uh, are established, uh, the the uh, the Umayyads, um, you know, in very short order, the Persian Empire yeah. disappears. The Zoroastrians stick around, and there's still some Zoroastrians, of course, in places like eastern Iran and and in and in western Pakistan. But that kind of the 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 nature of of, of, of political relationships changes radically in the later period, in the Byzantine yeah. period, et cetera. Because I, I actually, if you, if you answer my question, because I was thinking also in not in the sense of pushing refugees one way or another, but actually using maybe state services or some kind of campaign to actually lure out, right. weaken you know, their rival by virtue of... Right. I, I mentioned, for example, that uh, one, uh, I think it was, I can't remember which patriarch of Constantinople. A patriarch is like a big archbishop. These are like one, almost like a pope, but not quite like a pope. Uh, one uh, patriarch of Constantinople uh, apparently gave like refuge, refugee status to Persian Christians, people who were Christian, but from the Persian world. So again, you have this kind of like, we'll take them kind of attitude that, that exists. But the creation of a refugee crisis between these two states doesn't really kind of materialize in quite the same way. And what was the second question? Uh, the second question was, where does the role of, uh, it does uh, the rise of monasticism play into this? Uh, is this an opportunity for the really dispossessed Christian to be, well, I have nothing, so I'll go to a place where at least I can get it. It does, in, it does in certain places, and with a kind of refugee I haven't talked about, because I don't consider it part of them, but in Egypt in particular, and Egypt, by the way, guys, was like one of the places, one of the key places where monasticism actually uh, really takes, takes off. In Egypt, we have a different kind of refugee. We have so-called tax refugees. And these are people who can't afford to pay the quite considerable sums particularly uh, in the 5th and 6th centuries. And many of them do bugger off to monastic yeah. communities and uh, establish them and sit, become, become, become members of monks. It's a way of avoiding precisely those, those things. So you do have it at least in this one particular, this one particular region. Whether it, you know, it's representative of a broader phenomena, probably less important. The other thing that does happen though during this time in, this is sort of a little off topic in relation to monks and, and monasteries and things like that. This is when oblates really start taking off. That is, children who are given to, the, uh, given to monasteries to be raised either to become monks or as servants of the monastery, et cetera. That really starts taking off in this period as well. So that's kind of a also, you know, you can't take care of a kid and things like uh, infanticide was considered a no-no and there were these quite serious um, uh, both political and economic problems can happen. That we also see happening as well. But whether adults are actually all running off and, and joining, joining, the, uh, joining uh, a monastery, that's much less, uh, much less in evidence. Thank you. Mm, sure. Yeah. Um, you talked about a law yes. that said if, if you were starving or needed food, that a parent could sell their child right. um, and then buy them back. I was wondering if you could yeah. Like, give me more information about that and sure. how that actually, like, how the legislation actually, like, affected the children. Because then, and, like, how that plays into the normative attitude of the concern for children's vulnerability at this time. That's a really, really good question. The law was passed in, I believe, 458. It, uh, no, it would have been 455. 
And it was an emperor by the name of Valentinian III. He's an interesting character for a number of reasons, but he passed a series of new laws, and the Latin word for it is novella, which literally means new book or new law. We get the word novella from that, actually. I think it's novella number three, and he says in it, it's a very long law, and uh, I don't know if we have a copy of the, of the code, the law code here in the library, but we really should. Uh, it should be in every library as far as I'm concerned. But it's a very, very long law and has a number of provisions. So this is just one part of a larger series of provisions, and there, it's a law that is in direct reaction to Attila the Hun. Now, Attila the Hun came marching into the West. He created enormous amounts of devastation uh, in the early 450s. So this is just happening just before this law was passed. Uh, and then he had the good sense to die in 452. He supposedly died strangled on his, this the story is he strangled on his own vomit on his wedding night. So what happened was, among other things, fortunately for the Romans, that the confederation of, of tribes that uh, Attila uh, had put together all fell apart. And so he, the Huns as a, as a large group, a large threat to the Roman state largely disappeared. But the damage had been done. Large portions, and they practiced scorched earth <laughs> policy. They're probably the first people that we hear about who actually you know, really actively destroy everything they, everything they see. And that's one of the reasons why they're hated so much. So it's under these circumstances that large portions of what are now like modern northern Italy and Austria and Switzerland, there was large scale Famine, uh, uh, obviously the economies were shattered, uh, people were starving. So it's in, that, it's in that context that this law is passed. And, and Valentin, interestingly enough, doesn't say that you can sell yourself into slavery, although that is something you can do. If you're an adult legal Roman citizen and you decide, well, I want to sell myself into slavery, that was perfectly legal to do. What it does say is, is that um, you can sell your child into slavery. And this was new because you weren't supposed to legally Legally, that was something you never were able to do before. But that should be an indication of how desperate the situation actually was. So that probably, something like that was being passed, really says, okay, you know, things are really bad in a way that they haven't been bad before. And it's entirely clear that Valentinian, or Valentinian's legal officers who actually wrote the law, were entirely aware of how unusual this is. And that's why they put in all these sort of special kind of things. You have to let the parents buy them back at the first opportunity. You can't move them from point A to B. They have to stay in the place, et cetera. So it's kind of like a contingency, like, OK, it's better that they're slaves than that they starve and die. But we're going to try to ameliorate all the possible permutations that might occur now that they are unfree persons. They have lost their, their legal status as Roman citizens. So that's it. Now, the other thing that's quite important and significant about this, and this isn't just true of these particular kids, but anyone, any slave that's freed, once you are a slave and then subsequently freed, your legal status as a Roman citizen is different. In other words, the Romans made an important distinction between a free person, that is someone who is born to free, free parents, and a freed person. That is, someone who was formerly a slave and then was manumitted in one form or another. That could have very important implications upon that person's future in terms of what he or she could inherit, the sorts of things they might be able to do, et cetera. So that's another component, another feature of this. Now, I know this doesn't really exactly answer the question that you're, that you're that asking because the other thing that we have to say when we talk about laws is they don't tell us anything about reality. Right? You know? A law is a way in which a government wants you to act and behave. And you know, the other thing too is sometimes well, laws may indicate, you know, the ideals of a society, what we you know, murder is wrong, right? That kind of thing, you know. Um, but it really doesn't even tell us that too. What it does is it tells you the status of how the government wants you to behave at a certain point in time. Right? So the answer is, is that there is no real way to really answer that question because we don't have any kind of corroborating non-legal evidence to, to, to find out what's good. So long answer to not answering your, que <laughs> your, your question specifically. And this is a problem, actually this is a problem for most social historians working in the ancient world. Our single most abundant source of things like private life, of family, of children, et cetera, is law. So you can see the intrinsic problem with coming to these kinds of approaches when you have to depend on something that doesn't tell you 
anything really about reality in these. Okay. Yeah. Going along with that, I'm just so fascinated about the sources. If you could talk a little bit about the sources that are available to you, because you're saying laws are the primary kind of primary sources you use. What else did you use for this process? Um, there are a whole host of different sources. Um, obviously, the law codes are important, and we were actually very fortunate because we have at least pieces of Roman law going back to the very first times when it was written down in the in the fifth century BC, all the way up until up until uh, you know uh, the fifth and sixth centuries and beyond. So that's a very important component. We have these large legal texts that survive, in, often in fragmented pieces, all the way up to the sixth century. And it's important to note that when uh, the emperor Justinian, who lived in the sixth century, published his great law code, that sort of became sort of the sort of the institutional law code that was followed ever after. Church law today is largely based on uh, on Justinian's code. Civil law in Europe is largely based on Justinian's code. But outside of that, you know, we are we have to work with a whole pastiche of different sources. So we look at things. Obviously, there's the archaeological material, uh, which can be problematic, but also very interesting and insightful. Not for this particular topic, unfortunately, but in, in rare circumstances, it can. Um, we look at things like uh, letters, uh, and we do have a number of letters that survive. They have their own issues as sources. I won't go into those. It, or I can if you want to. Um, we have things like, uh, particularly in this period, we obviously have the writing of the patristic writers, the church writers, who write very, very long, long treatises on things that are kind of related to this sometimes. We have some of their homilies, that is the sermons that they give in churches every Sunday morning that survive. So I mentioned Augustine. We have over 300 of his sermons that survive. That's Pretty impressive. I think it's actually over 500 for him. Uh, but we have them from all sorts of other people. Um, we also have, obviously, historians. Historians wrote in this period as well. So we have both secular historians, those who wrote in the traditional form. Some of you guys may have read Herodotus or Thucydides or Tacitus, these fam very famous Greek and Roman historians. But we also have what we call church historians. That is people, historians who are trained in sort of these traditional historical, uh, these historical uh, disciplines but we're interested in the history of Christianity and how Christianity became important. And those take on some very interesting forms. One of my favorite ones, I mentioned him very, very briefly, is a guy named Erosius, who was a priest who was living in Spain in the fifth century. And I talked about this great sack of Rome. This great sack of Rome in 410 caused an enormous existential crisis for the empire. One, because it was the symbolic heart. It was the capital of the Roman Empire. It had been sacked by these these barbarians, what does this mean? But it also had an enormous impact upon Christians because Christians had just recently had made Christianity the official religion of the empire. They said, no more of this pagan stuff. And the pagans, once they said sack, they said, you see? You see what happens when we give up on the old gods? This is what happens. And the Christians were like going, Oh my God, but we're all Christian now. How could this possibly happen? You know, this kind of thing. So one of the things that this guy Erosius does is he writes this history called Seven Books Against the Pagans. And it's basically it's a long history talking about all the crap that happened when they were pagan. And he said, no, things, things, are, things are actually better now that we're Christian. So don't pay attention to this one thing, etc. So we have that kind, of, that kind of material available as well. There are other things as well, but those are often the things that we look to and we focus on when we try to reconstruct things like refugees or, or alternatively also when you do things like what I'm interested in specifically, which is you know, family in that, in that period as well. We do have a poetry, we do have, we have, you know, every so often you get kind of odd pieces of work. So that, where did the case studies come from? Okay, so the case studies, okay. So Maria, we know about some letter, actually from one letter that survives from a bishop, a guy named Theodoret, I mentioned, he's, he's in, in this city in, in uh, what's now modern Syria, and he's writing about her saying, I've got this girl, she's been kidnapped. And she probably was actually the daughter of, of, a, of a minor governor in North Africa. So she was kind of a, from an important family. And, how, and he basically telling, about his, telling a story to this other bishop and asking this bishop to help book a passage for her back to North Africa. So that's how we know about her. These ladies, this family of women, we know about from a number of different sources. We actually know this uh, from uh, some letters of uh, Augustine, 
Uh, we know about it from actually some inscriptions. So I mentioned how Demetrius uh, managed to get back to Rome and she was able to reclaim some property. One of the things she did was, has any, have you been to Rome? Have you, do, do you all know? Have you ever seen the Church of St. Stephen's? That was one of her, uh, on the Via Latina, that was one of her, that was her property. She built a church and there's some inscriptions on the church talking a little bit about her life as well. So we have several different sources for her. Paulinus of Pella, we know from a poem that he wrote. I mentioned I, this Thanksgiving, which is an autobiographical poem that talks about his long life. He's in his 80s when he's writing this. And he's, you know, as I said, he's on this kind of sad, pathetic little uh, bit of land outside of what's now the modern city of Marseille. So we have these. Um, as for the others, we know this uh, from a church history, uh, also from another church history. Uh, these come, as I said, from the letters of, letters of Augustine. So we get them from a lot of different sources. There's no direct topic or no direct work that says, well, let's talk about refugees. Let's, let's so deal with it. You have, to, you have to be creative and eclectic. Yeah. Basically, you grab. And this is, this is both the wonderful thing and the horrible thing about doing ancient history is, is that we have a finite number of sources. And it's imagine like having this enormous, once upon a time, there's this enormous 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle, and you have 12 pieces. And then you have to try to reconstruct what the picture looks like you know, by using those 12 pieces, right? So that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the fun, but it's also the frustration. Whereas working in the modern world, right, your problem isn't lack of sources. It's the opposite. It's just the opposite. Yeah. You have so many sources. What don't you include, et cetera? So it's a very different kind of it, sort of uh, methodological investigation in those circumstances. The, the current debate isn't whether Rome fell or not. Um, in the last 50 years, I mentioned this, this new field of late antiquity, the, the model is now less about collapse of civilization and, tra and now transformation. That is from one kind of civilization, one kind of society, sort of turning into a different kind of one. So it sort of takes out sort of that sort of moral component, et cetera. But there are still people who are big fans uh, of collapse as well. And there, there are some pretty strong arguments in both both cases. Full disclosure, uh, I'm a transformation guy myself, so uh, I, prefer, I prefer that perspective, but both have, have validity. So um, it depends on who you talk to. Get 10 historians, Roman historians up there, they'll give you 10 different uh, uh, answers to that question.